Okay, we're back. We're alive for a special show, what we call a squeeze show. That means it's very important. This is Energy in America in the off week. Lou Pugliarisi of the Energy Policy Research Foundation in Washington, D.C., who's going to talk to us about oil prices and their effect on the global economy. And we sure know they've, dr they've gone down dramatically. Hi, Lou. Thanks for joining us today. Good to be here, Jay, as always. So what, what so, is the extent of the drop, and what does it mean? So, yeah, first let's talk a little bit about that world, econ world uh, direct value of oil and petroleum products. Yes. And I'm not talking about the guy working in the gas stations. I'm, and I'm just talking the direct sale of the primary commodities, oil and gas, about $4 trillion a year. Worth. If you drop the value of that by 25%, that's a trillion dollars. You might say that's a trillion dollars in lost value, but it's also a trillion dollars of a shift between producers to consumers. And I think this is kind of, we should kind of put this into context. You know, from the start of 2019 until February 2020, the North American stock market ran way up. The S&P index rose 35%. NASDAQ wrote 48 percent, Dow Jones, Dow Jones, uh, and so we've had a big retrenchment. People are very nervous about this drop in oil prices because not as if it's just a standard transfer of, okay, the producers lose, but the consumers gain. And I think consumers are gaining from this drop. For example, for the airlines, jet fuel prices are way down. So this is going to help take some of the pain. But as we just heard, the president just announced halting all European flights into the United States. Except the well, UK. Except the UK. Except the UK. That's a huge problem. Now, I don't know if you can transit through the UK from other parts of Europe. It's quite a, it's quite a shock. Uh, and, you know, my personal view is, you know, this is a serious infectious disease, but uh, we're going to have to kind of accept at some level that we're going to have to manage it. We're not going to be able to stop it entirely. And large numbers of people are recovering from it. So I, I don't know how we work our way through this, but I do think that the decision of the Saudis actually to announce that they would produce more oil, that they would drop their official selling prices, and combined with the demand, huge demand reductions we're seeing as a result of the coronavirus is actually a, a double whammy of a shock. You know, years ago, you could say, well, this is bad for the producers, and good for the U.S. because we were a net uh, importer, a very massive net importer. But we are actually a very, as I'm going to show you in some slides, a very large net exporter now of oil and gas. So we are going to lose a lot of capital investment in the oil and gas business in the next uh, Already we had a lot of companies, and particularly in the unconventional uh, resources in the Permian Basin, North Dakota, who are operating on very tight margins. We're going to see some bankruptcies. We're not going to lose the oil. It's still going to be in the ground. But it's not like, the, you know, it's not like 20 years ago. Well, it's particularly Today, painful because, because the, um, you know, the oil companies have just recently invested a lot of money into infrastructure to make all this happen, right? And now fresh yes. on that, that investment, uh, they have no return or a smaller return. Yeah, and I think that this is so, it's not so much so, of course the Saudis are, 
the Saudis have made a run, you could argue, at the shale producers before. But they're a very diverse group. They're very resourceful. They've shown a capacity to uh, drop their break-even costs. And I would say uh, each time they went through one of these downturns, they came back much stronger and financially, uh, let's see, more capable. Now, for years, I think the industry did benefit from investors willing to look at growth and quit worrying so much about capital discipline. But I would say in the last uh, 24 months, many of the companies now have found their investors saying, well, we've had the, we've invested in growth, now we want to invest in return. And so you have a lot of strict discipline taking place in the industry now, and it's going to be a very tough road ahead. When you now, say that a I, lot of these companies are going to go bankrupt or are considered I think bankrupt, some, what does that mean? Long, what, what does that mean? How does that affect that. us? Well, bank, if you have a lot of large-scale bankruptcies, and I'm sure we'll have large-scale, uh, we will have, um, but we will have some companies going through a start time. We'll have the big oil companies come in and buy some of them. That's not so bad. They operate very efficiently. But I do think that uh, we're going to see a downturn in U.S. production if these prices stay. And we may, over the next year, lose a million barrels a day. And so if we go to the, let, let's look at the one day drop in oil prices and see where it fits in. So I think it's important to understand this is not the first time this has happened. You know, In 1991, we had a massive drop in oil prices, 2001 and 2009. We also had large declines. And actually, in the 2000 and the 2000 drop, we did see some adjustments in uh, oil output because by 2009, shale production was under, you know, on its way, and you could see a dip that occurred. But this is a large drop, and I don't think it's just about the Saudis or the major Middle Eastern oil producers trying to drive the shale guys out of business, I don't really think they can do that. I think the nature of the shale production process is that, um, yeah, they may slow down, they may uh, park the rigs, they may uh, lay people off, but the resource is still there. It's a short cycle kind of investment. As soon as prices come back, they'll come back. Mm -hmm. I think it's really a tr an attempt of the Saudis to get some cooperation from the Russians. And actually, I'm almost thinking the Russians may have misplayed this one. They may have thought, well, they'll play hardball and the Saudis will do all the heavy lifting. And the Saudis said no. And I remember they did this in the 1980s. Everyone kept thinking, well, the Saudis will cut. They'll carry all of us. And then one day the Saudis said, no, we're not doing that anymore. Price of oil at that time was about $36 a barrel. I would say this is 84, 85, 86. It dropped in half to $12 a barrel. So this, is, this isn't this is anything we haven't seen before. Now, if you go to the next picture. So let me, let me just uh, ask about that. So go ahead. at the end of the day, the Saudis uh, have stood fast in their play with Russia. Um, and they have uh, increased production and thus uh, the price of oil has gone down. But what about Russia? What's the effect on Russia from... The, from losing that uh, that foray? So I think for the Russians, it's, it's clearly going to make their imports more expensive. But since their domestic, their production platform in Russia is based on the ruble, they just, the ruble just will depreciate. It has already started, it has depreciated remarkably. And that helps to keep their costs in line domestically but it does mean really the value of their production has fallen. And you could argue that they can adjust to this and they have it, but it means that there are going to be substantial losses of income, wealth, and the budget for, you figure the, the Russian government depends upon 30% of its budget from oil and gas. U.S. it's minuscule.
We are a very large economy. Oil is important, but it doesn't define who we are. So this is going to have a bigger effect on the Russian economy because the share of the Russian economy represented by oil and gas is definitely going to affect the, the economy and the budget and the budget. Mm -hmm. Now, Putin right now is trying to get a constitutional amendment through, which I think will succeed, which will essentially give him the same uh, position as President Xi in China. And mm -hmm. if he gets to stick around, life. so. Uh, so I think that that's one issue. I, I do think, though, but if you look at, I was looking at this for the U.S., what does this mean to kind of consumers? Yes. The drop in oil prices, though, will give some help to consumers. I think for the driving public alone, it's worth about $35 billion a year. So it's bad on some aspects of the economy, but there are some benefits. Jet fuel, gasoline prices. And the, the drop is, is probably going to show up of a price drop. You'll even see this in Honolulu between 25 and 30 cents a gallon. Now, you know, you know that uh, the, 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 the cheaper um, the cost of energy, uh, the better the economy. In other words, low energy costs actually, um, you know, tend to improve the economy. I mean, they run they run together. Um, I wonder if, if that really means anything in this market. If we have cheaper energy costs by cheaper gas, cheaper oil, uh, is that going to help the economy? I mean, as, well, in the as short a run, national economy? it may not help. If, you're, if you have constraints, like you can't fly anywhere, I mean, if you're quarantined, you know, you're really not going to drive around the block. And even if you're not quarantined, how much more can you drive in the short run? These things take time to filter through the economy. So I hope our policymakers understand that. I understand coronavirus. I mean, the Saudi play is something, it happens from time to time. We can adjust to this, but I, you know, my, my personal view is, and I'd say even my own family don't agree with me. We are overreacting to the coronavirus. Uh, I have a lot of friends who think I'm crazy, but, um, you know, we, we have a massive amount of people catch the flu every year in the U S we have quite variations from year to year in the survival rates of the flu, but there's something about this coronavirus that, uh, creates a level of fear. I think that's out of proportion. I'm not saying it's, it's not, it is serious, but it's having almost no effect on young people, according to the data out of China and data out of Italy. It's mostly affecting elderly people my age, you know, or <laughs> who have uh, Im, you know, impaired immune systems. And yeah, okay, we should do a lot of reasonable things. But guess what? We, we have lots of viruses out there, and we're going to see more. Now, I think a lot of people are very concerned. They say, well, the infection rate is very high. We have to pull out all the stops. But I do think somebody in, the, somebody in authority needs to do some careful thinking of what is the cost to the health of society if our economic growth rate declines in half? If tourism dries up in Hawaii, What's the cost of that? I bet you the cost of that's a lot higher. You just can't measure it very well. So and I bet you that health shows up in shows up in people's health and their. You well ascribe to the notion then. Don't get too excited about this. Uh, then yeah, my view is: do all the responsible things you can do as a society. Have a lot of testing. Try to quarantine people in place if they catch it. Try to test a lot of people. Try to limit the amount and the pace of the rate of infection. But it's not the bubonic plague, okay? It's not the Spanish flu. So we have what, what you're really flu. talking about is uh, it isn't necessary to stop all the flights from Europe. It isn't necessary to uh, cancel all these uh, conferences and events all over the country. It isn't necessary I, to, know, to cut I'm, I'm uh, air sure service. Yeah, I'm sure I'm in the minority on this view, okay? And I understand I'm in the minority in the view. Believe me, 
a lot of people think I'm crazy, but I don't think <laughs> I don't think this makes any sense to me. <laughs> you, you know what, though? I mean, I've, I've heard this view, uh, you know, from many people, actually. But the, the, the reality, Lou, is that it's happening. The reality is that uh, people uh, at the individual level are effectively panicking and businesses are effectively panicking. Hey, this and there is you have very it. serious. Yeah. And so it's a public confidence and a business confidence issue. And that's the market. That's the way the market works based on confidence. No. Absolutely. The expectations are what's driving everything now. And, you know, we did a paper way up many years ago about oil prices running up very high. And our view was that was entirely on a set of expectations that people had on new production that did not happen. Now we're going through a set of expectations. And I, actually, I think we could get a, a very strong recovery uh, if uh, the rates of infection slow down and people calm down a bit. But uh, so far, I'm not seeing that. No. So but the other thing I want to think about, other thing to think about that no one's thinking about is that these low oil prices, yeah, they have effect in the U.S., but what about Mexico, Brazil, Colombia, uh, Argentina? These economies are going to take a huge hit when these prices fall. And uh, it, they're not going to adjust very easily to it. So I, I think we're in for a rocky road. Hopefully this thing will start to abate and we can go back to uh, kind of normal uh, terms of business and, and lifestyles. So, well, one of the things you said that's very uh, intriguing to me is uh, that, that once we get out of the panic phase, once we can feel more comfortable about the virus, uh, once uh, the number of cases decline and uh, we have some scientific advances, uh, then the, the economy, quote, will come roaring back, end quote. Uh, how, fast, That's the how fast is roaring, Lou? Well, <laughs> well, you know, hopefully it's an inverted V. You know, that it came down hard, it'll come back hard. There's, no, there's nothing fundamentally wrong. You know, first, China is coming back. They have got it under control, I believe, now. They still have lots of rules. You have to long social distance at work, but I think the supply chains are coming back up online. And, uh, but I do think that, um, yeah, that expectations are, it's the uncertainty. People have a hard time dealing with uncertainty. And frankly, I do think the media has hyped this or not fail to put it into perspective. Let me put that up, put it, say mm -hmm. that. I don't think people have a good perspective on it. Life has lots of risks every day. You can, uh, lifetime risk for driving an automobile is a 1% chance of dying. Right? We, have lot, we have lots of risks we face. And the question is how best to manage them in an intelligent way. And the panic that's going on now, you, you've seen these videos of the people buying toilet paper at Costco in Honolulu. It's ridiculous. And it has nothing to do with, with the coronavirus either. Nothing. No, I have no idea why people are doing that. Well, it goes back to the shipping strikes, 1946, uh, where there was a <laughs> shortage in such things. And people, you know, uh, you know went and bought every, every roll of toilet paper. So let me, let me ask you about Saudi Arabia. You know, after they reduced, they increased uh, their production and thus reduced the price, and, and it had a, you know, a, a, an accelerating effect on price reduction around the world. How does the Middle East, how does Saudi Arabia and the Middle East, you know, uh, what does that affect on them? Uh, are they going to lose? Well, I think too? it's a problem because, you know, there is this data from... Uh, called break-even price that's that's calculated by the IMF and the World Bank. And it's not really like you and I would think break-even price, which is what does it cost to produce the oil and what do I get for it? It's a kind of social break-even cost. And what is it, how much money do they need to run the budget? And I've always been somewhat suspicious of this because I have a break-even price for my budget, but if I have less money, I just... <laughs> get by on a smaller budget. 
But that's apparently not how they think about things in the Middle East. And yes, I would say we have some data. If you look at Saudi Arabia and the Iraq and the Emirates, most people think, most analysts think they need somewhere between 60 and $80 a barrel to meet all their social obligations. So this is not a sustainable strategy for the Saudis either. Mm -hmm. And my view is that what the Saudis are doing is, and look, we have the stamina, we have the resources to do this for a while, maybe, maybe a year, maybe two years. We don't really know. And that you, the other producers, particularly Russia, some of the other OPEC producers, you don't have that. So you need to cooperate on helping to manage this market. So I, I think that's what the Saudis are trying to do. We'll see how that goes. It's like who um, blinks first. It's like a game of chicken. Right. I think the right and I think the Russians did send a statement out today saying, oh, no, we don't want to go to war over this. The door is open for discussions. So. Well, do you think the, uh, you know, the decline of the global economy will bring the parties to the table? Yes, I think it will. I think it will. That will be a positive The real development. question is, what's the long-run price of oil? It's probably not 20 or $30. It's probably closer to 50 yes. By the way, one thing I know is dear to your heart. Uh, new data shows that uh, electric vehicle sales as a percent of light-duty vehicle sales has continued to fall now for almost 12 straight months accelerating with the fall in oil prices ah uh, but 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 wait but wait uh, that 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 doesn't seem to be consistent with the notion if you buy fewer electric vehicles and use fewer electric vehicles um then maybe you go to you know fossil fuel cars and you buy them instead thus increasing the consumption of gas no so I think this is exactly what the Saudis have in mind. <laughs> <laughs> they're they're attracting new new uh, new cars that are possible. Yeah, I, cars. Uh, someone I haven't seen it yet. Said, someone said that the Norwegians have just uh, now required EV uh, drivers in Norway to pay road tolls, and apparently EV sales in Norway are collapsing dramatically. So. <laughs> Well, one, one question I would ask you that's sort of inherent in this whole discussion is we are in a transformational period and, um, you know, it's uh, traumatic in many ways, uh, economically and, and maybe medically too, of course. Um, but, you know, when we come out the other side, however we come out the other side, because every, every pandemic ends at some point for one reason or another, uh, yeah, yeah. it will end and the, and the markets will stabilize. I, I, I'm not sure they'll climb right up, but they'll stabilize anyway. So the question yeah. is, when we get to the other side, how will things be different? How will those things be different, for example, electric vehicles? How will they be different in oil prices and production? How will they be different in the global economy and in the geopolitical? I know that's a question you could take some time to answer, but, but how right. do you react to that question? So I think how they'll be different is, one thing they'll be different is um, renewables, not entirely, but it's somewhat of a rich man's game. And uh, cheaper. They're cheaper than fossil fuels. But that's actually not true, right? I mean, it's true. There have, it's true at uh, uh, relatively modest penetration rates in the utility sector. Natural gas is quite cheap. And I do think one of the... And you look around the U.S., you can see this in the rejection in some of these initiatives. I think this so-called uh, transportation climate initiative in the Northeast, which was aimed at increasing gasoline prices. So what I would say is that when you go through a period of economic stress, it is politically difficult to do the things you're, you're gonna want to do, which is increase the cost of fossil fuels. Because if the, if the, if the public is hurting, they're not going to want their political leaders to do that. So I, I think there's going to be a rough go for the petroleum industry for a few years. I think it's going to be a harder row mm -hmm. for the renewable industry as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The other question and, that pops up is, is uh, 
uh, I, I'm sorry, I don't want to interrupt. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Okay. Uh, the other question that pops up, Lou, is, uh, you know, we talked earlier about investment. We talked investment by the oil companies, investment by everybody in the, in the landscape. Um, but when you have a period of uncertainty, as you mentioned, certainly this is a period of uncertainty. That's the certain thing about this period. It is certainly <laughs> uncertain. <laughs> so my question is, who is going to make serious investment you know, of billions of dollars, as might ordinarily be the case, uh, in moving, you know, the energy, energy sector, energy uh, infrastructure. So, if ahead. you're a major, if you're a major oil company like Exxon Mobil or Chevron, you have a 30, 40 year horizon. You're, you don't like this. This is a bad outcome. You have a period of uh, turmoil. You cut where you can, but you invest through the downturn because institutionally you've learned to do that you've learned that you know you have a long run view of the world and yeah you adjust to it in the short run you try to cut where you can but you also look for opportunities to consolidate to get more efficient to buy more, more assets so that that's what i think will happen this is well, going to be over in three to four months I mean, the scars will remain for a while but it's going to be over well, Angela Merkel said that, um, I forget the exact numbers, but I recall she said something like two-thirds of the country will be infected. And of those two-thirds, there's a certain demographic over the age of, what, 65 or 70, uh, who, you know, uh, as it stands now, medical science will not be able to protect them. They will die. Um, and this will keep on going. And to the extent that there is panic now, there'll they'll be increasing panic is, if her prediction is correct. And her prediction may apply to all of Europe, and her prediction may apply to all the United States too, because you know. Right, but we are people. losing. Right. We lose. I looked at the in fact, the CDC website is absolutely fascinating, and I would look at it. You can see variations in hospitalization from the from the flu, year on year up from four percent one year going to eleven percent for a certain demographic, let's say, population. 70 and older, whatever the number, they have it in the CDC site. So yeah, we have huge variations. We lose lots of people to the flu in the US. I don't know the number. It can be anywhere from 15,000 to 40,000. It's not like no one dies from uh, the flu. But, but my lots point though, die. to address your, your thought about how this is gonna be resolved in two or three months, uh, I mean, I don't see uh, a medical breakthrough in two or three months. I don't see a vaccine in two or three months. Uh, maybe maybe uh, people get, you know, sort of get used to the idea of panic and, and thus that makes panic less panicky. But, but in, in terms of the other factors on the stage, um, it would seem to me that as we go forward, the same factors that have driven oil prices down, that threaten the global economy, that threaten the, the demographic for uh, older people are going to continue. Uh, so why why do you say in two or three months it'll be resolved? Because we have this experience with Ebola, MERS, swine flu, and maybe this is so different, but that's the only historical record we can look to. And all of those went through a cycle, but eventually the cycle played out. And uh, the cycle for this will, I think, play out as well. We're going to find ways to either uh, accommodate it or limit its contagion. Mm -hmm. But we will do that. This reminds me a little bit about the time where everyone said after the first Gulf War, it was going to take three years to put out all the fires in Kuwait. Yeah, that's what it looked like. It looked like an impossible job. But, you know... Uh, we have a lot of resourceful people in this country and other places, and they are able to put out those fires in four to five months. So, you know, we learn as we go along. I hope I don't so. Think we should be so pessimistic. So, what is your what is your advice to the the government? What is your advice to the nation on this? Aside from you know not being so pessimistic, uh, what affirmative steps would you recommend in order for us to deal with it, both on a you know an energy basis and on a global? Uh, economy basis. So if it were me, I would have a system to, I think they, the CDC was remiss in not having, they should have, you know, got the FDA to 
out of the way and said, look, you need to buy the kits from Europe, buy them from Europe. I don't think we should have over-regulated the kits for testing. We should do a lot more testing. We should have research unable to see if we can detect it on people who are asymptomatic. If someone is, has a fever and they're likely to recover, most people do recover, uh, they should stay home. Uh, I think, yeah, you may, if you have, if you're, if you have certain uh, compromising symptoms and you're of certain age, you should probably avoid large crowds, uh, not, uh, you know, not engage in too much social activity, and then go about our business. I, I just don't think um, I agree that. Uh, you know, if you see what the Chinese done did, and they looks to me like they're bringing it under control, we don't have that kind of authoritarian uh, a capacity in the West. We're not going to mm -hmm. do that. Mm -hmm. We're not going to lock. We're not going to go to people's homes and and take them to a, a quarantine center. It's going to happen. Well, I, we're going to get to talk about this uh, at least a little bit next week, Lou. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I suggest to you that there will be changes to, you know, to uh, maybe uh, change our thinking or at least uh, uh, include in our analysis next week. That's uh, Lou Pugliarisi, uh, Energy Policy Research Foundation <laughs> in Washington, talking about energy prices and how they are affecting the country and the global economy. We are so happy to be able to talk to you today, Lou. Thank you so All much. All right. Take care, Jay. Take care. <laughs> Wash your hands. Uh, yes. <laughs>